Hello there, I'm Nick and welcome to Gravitonic. Today I want to talk about how exactly is the daily routine of a theoretical physicist. You see, when I decided I wanted to be a physicist back in high school, actually I've always thought a little bit about it, I've always wanted to be a scientist. But anyway, in high school I was sure I wanted to be a physicist, but I knew nothing about what exactly a physicist does. Then I got into undergraduate school, and during undergraduate, I also still didn't know what exactly a theoretical physicist does. Then I got into my master's degree, and at the beginning of my master's degree, I also did not know what the hell a theoretical physicist does as, they, as their daily routine. And I think this is something quite difficult to, to find around. I never saw anyone talking about it, so I think it would be a really nice theme for a video to explain how exactly was my daily routine during my master's and how exactly is my daily routine nowadays uh, as a researcher in theoretical physics. In, in theoretical physics. It's hard to, to think exactly of how to speak it or how to, to speak about it. Let's go. For example, what I was doing yesterday or today, most of the time, I mean, essentially all the time, you're just trying to understand something. So, in my case, currently, there are these recent books by Raphael Busso, which really drive my attention, I really find them interesting. And so, most of my days recently have been spent in trying to understand what exactly he did. So I just pick some papers, some existing papers that draw my attention, or some interesting books that draw my attention because I want to learn a specific subject. Because I think that somehow I can contribute to the subject later. So I first want to learn about it, and then afterwards I plan on walking with it. So it's similar, for example, to how you initially study electrodynamics or so. You are interested in physics, but you still know nothing about physics. So you start by learning physics. So you start learning what already exists. So eventually you might start doing research on that. So the first step for research is typically this. It's a literature review, as we sometimes call it, in which you are learning what people already know about something that interests you, whatever it may be. And once you do that, for example, in my master's degree, I wanted to walk in quantum field theory and curve space time. So how exactly we can merge quantum mechanics and general relativity together in an incomplete way, so we know gravity in that is not quantized, but it is very useful still to, to find conclusions about how exactly quantum phenomena manifest themselves in curved space time. So you start by learning what people already know about that. I started by reading books on quantum field theory and curved space time, by reading the original papers, by reading stuff, and just learning what people already knew. And that took me about six to seven months, I think, Something like that. Uh, I read, I followed mainly Ward's book on quantum field theory and space time in black hole thermodynamics. There's one here that I sometimes might bring up. And it is a 200 page book. It took me six months to read. So, yes, uh, reading stuff is not exactly easy as a researcher, <laughs> depending on how difficult the topic is. Eventually, as you learn how to study, how to read things, you, you get a little bit faster. So nowadays I'm reading quite faster than I used to. I can get stuff more easily because I have more knowledge. The more knowledge you have, the easier it is to get new knowledge, I'd say, at least in a specific area. So I, don't longer, I no longer need to keep checking hundreds and hundreds of references to understand each word that the author is using. Instead, I can just read one book uh, and get it directly. Of course, uh, you, you also need to, to read many different papers. So to get to the, to the recent papers that I want to work with, I actually need to read some 20 year old papers and it is a, a, a long process. Anyway, um, so that is what you do at first, you just start reading stuff, learning about stuff that people already know. In my case, it was quantum field theory and space time and then the functional evaluation group, which is a technique we use to describe non perturbative physics and some scenarios, I started working with it on quantum field theory and space time, but people already used it before. There's one application I know of in quantum field theory and space time that was by a 
student of my advisor. And there are many applications in point gravity, in condensed matter physics, and so on and so forth. So you start by learning topics that people already know. I started with that. And eventually, you get to the point you actually want to work with. You have some question that you want to answer. In my case, it was how exactly a two-level detector interacts with a quantum field in a curved space-time when you consider non-perturbative effects, which is a fairly technical thing. I may talk about it in less technical terms in another video, but whatever, this is just an example for now. And then I started working on that. So I had the tools. I know, okay, I want to use this, this, and this. I know how to use these things, at least basically. And I want to use this to build a new thing. So it's similar to you use the hammer before, you use the screwdriver before, and now you just want to build a house. And then you find out that building a house is not as easy as you thought. So it's actually quite some time. It's something like the difficult part of research, or research, I never knew about it. Never know what to say. Anyway, research. <laughs> as it feels a little bit sometimes as an endless math test with a really difficult question. And as I said, it's endless. It won't stop until you figure the question out. And you will take quite a while to figure it out. So we're not talking like undergraduate problems in which you're just trying to solve something and it is really, really difficult and you might take a week. We are talking about something that is really, really difficult and might take you literally months to crack it open. Because it has many nuances you won't figure at first, it has many difficulties you won't figure at first, and there are times in which you're just stuck thinking, okay, what the hell can I do to, to solve this thing? And you are with no ideas and you just keep trying whatever comes to your mind until eventually a really good idea comes up, you try it and you progress a little bit. And then you go back to the place of not knowing what to do. And it just repeats itself for a really long time. And you learn a lot of stuff from this. So I spent literally one year and a half uh, working with the problem from, from my master's degree until I, I cracked it. And so it is a really long problem. And it is often something difficult to do. It's not something that will take you a week or two weeks. It's something that might take you months uh, in a conservative way of viewing things. And some problems can even take years. <laughs> and some problems are open for decades and we still don't know what exactly to do with them. So quantum gravity started as a problem back in, in the 1930s with Rosenfeld and what's the other guy? Bronstein, which was a, a Matej Bronstein, he was a, I'm not really sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but he was a, a Paul of Lavandau. And Leon Rosenfeld was a, I believe, a student of Lewis Bohr. Uh, Bronstein, right? B R O N S T E I N. Anyway, so it started with them in the 30s, and still nowadays we don't really know how to quantize gravity in a fully satisfactory way. We know how to quantize gravity in an unsatisfactory way, which breaks down when quantum gravity starts being really interesting, <laughs> but we still can quantize it. We just don't know how to quantize it in a, the technical term, in a UV, in a UV complete sense. Anyway, so some problems are really difficult and you just spend quite a while trying to figure them out. So you can think of them as pick a hard problem you have to solve in undergraduate or perhaps in high school or whatever. In whichever level you are in. Research is like that. It's a difficult problem that will take you a lot of time to solve. And there's no answers in the back of the book. You don't really know what the answers are. There's no uh, structure solution manual or anything like that. You just keep trying until it eventually pops out or until you find out that, okay, I think I was wrong and I've been trying to answer the wrong question. It happened to me this week when I was trying to work on, on a personal project. And it happened that not only my calculations were going wrong, but also that what I was trying to show had already was already known. <laughs> so sometimes it happens, sometimes things go south. And that's life. 
But most of the time, it is really fun. Okay, not most of the time, but they're really fun times. When you actually get a little progress that you only get once in a while, it is extremely satisfying. And I get extremely excited with my walk, and I just start walking a lot in that week because I'm really, really, really excited about what I'm doing. And I'm avoiding um, bad walls and stuff. <laughs> I really wanted to use one. Anyway, <laughs> so you just keep doing that. And sometimes it's just a regular job. You must think of research as a job. It is walking. So it is in, sometimes it is similar to any other job you would have out there. And it's important to keep that in mind because research is a job. A cool job for some people, but it is a job. And sometimes it's just a job. So you're just trying to, to have progress and you're a little bit lost and you don't really know what to do and you talk to people to see whether they give you any insights, you start something or some other things to see whether they give you any insights. And it keeps going like that. Eventually you do have a really nice idea. You start working on that and you have some progress in the project. And sometimes you don't. So it's not something that you're making progress every day. It's not something that you are stuck every day. It's this process of you're stuck, you make progress. You're stuck, you make progress. You're stuck, you make progress. And that typically is what a good research project is. If you just make progress, progress it's probably too easy and you could be doing more interesting things. If you're just stuck, it is too hard and you could be doing more interesting things. So it's just this. Intercalation, I don't know if this word exists in English, <laughs> of being stuck and doing progress, being stuck and doing progress, being stuck and doing progress, and so on and so forth, and so eventually you start to crack things open. And what you notice is that across several months, you start looking back and you say, okay, I still don't know what is going on here, but now I understand it better. So I still don't know the full picture, but there are things that I didn't understand before that I understand now. So I did make progress in small things. And now, while I don't know the answer, I understand the problem better. I understand better what I'm trying to solve, what I'm trying to do, and how exactly I could try to improve on these things. This happened a lot during my master's degree. I mean, uh, at the beginning, I had essentially no idea of what exactly I was doing. And I think that's the start of many projects, especially when you are a grad student. And eventually, things started to make sense. I was trying many things. They were going wrong. I started trying other things. They were doing wrong as well. I made a lot of mistakes and eventually I learned from these mistakes. I was starting to see, okay, this route doesn't work because of this, this and this. This route doesn't work because of this, this and this. I can try this other route which might work because of this, this and this and so on and so forth. So you start having progress in your failures and I think that is much of what a researcher does. We learn from our errors. We learn from our mistakes essentially all the time. So most of the job is not exactly feeling like you know things. It's more like feeling you don't know things, but learning from it. And, and it is interesting. It is fun. When you, when you get to grip of it, when you start to understand, okay, I don't need to make progress every day. I don't need to make progress every week. Sometimes I don't even need to make progress every month, uh, depending on how difficult the problem is. Then you start feeling better about it and you start understanding it and you start comprehending and keeping your expectations where they should be, in which you will make progress eventually, but it doesn't need to be now, it doesn't need to be immediately, and etc. So you start thinking better about these things and feeling better about your work. And it is important to always remember that it is a job. It is a job, it's not a dream or something like that. You might really like it, but it's a job. Just like any other job. <laughs> um, and eventually you start making progress. And you started liking it. At least for me, I started. There were many times in which I was okay. This is never going to work. This is doomed to be a failure or whatever. And eventually, it worked. So it was difficult at the beginning, especially because as a grad student, you don't really know what you're doing. So you're just learning it. You're, it's your first time doing research. It's your first time trying to understand things that no one else knows, and that is a ridiculously difficult thing. So it's the hardest exercise, the hardest question, the hardest problem you've ever faced. And it might take you a while to actually start to understand it very well. 
but it does bring the satisfaction of eventually feeling like, hey, I did something new. I did something that no one else did before. And I am the world's leading expert on this very specific problem, which is a really nice feeling. <laughs> Uh, you start feeling a little bit more important and a little bit more successful. And eventually you start grasping the thing of, oh, so that's how it works. And once I did that, it, everything got more interesting. So my, my latest failure was, okay, it happens. In a ball, as opposed to my previous failures, which had been a lot of, oh, I don't think I, I fit in this. I don't think I work for this. I think I'm not enough or the problem is too hard for me and so on and so forth. So you learn, and you grow, and things go like that. So, I guess a lot of, of being a, a theoretical physicist is why this, this thing. So, you study, you learn what, thing, what people already know, you have some problem in your head that you want to solve. So sometimes the problem comes before studying, sometimes you are like, oh, this seems like a really interesting work, perhaps I should learn a little bit about it, just because you're curious, or because you think, hey, I, I think this might come in handy later, or I think I might want to write about it later if some idea comes up. And you learn some stuff, and you start working on the problem. If it exists, sometimes you just learn some stuff and say, okay, I'm happy. Let's go back to other stuff. I done it sometimes. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because you never know when things come in handy. If you're interested about it, it might be useful. Otherwise, it might just not be useful. You never know. So you just try to control yourself to not invest too many time, too much time on things you shouldn't really be doing because you also have your problems to solve. But it's interesting to now and then just study something new, try to crack open something new, perhaps to think, hey, I think I might contribute to this in a way no one else has done yet. And, and so on. So first, you learn things that people already know. You just get to the point where you should be in order to do research, in order to find out new things. Once you're there, you start bringing yourself, bringing together knowledge you already have, or searching for other knowledge you already, you think you will need, as you try to crack a problem open. You have a lot of times in which you get frustrated because things aren't really working out as you would like them to, because you get stuck, you get stuck quite a lot. And sometimes you're really excited about this idea, and. I think this is going to solve it, and you try it, and it doesn't. And you keep trying other things until eventually one of them does. Or until eventually you just say, okay, I don't really want to continue on this anymore. And you go to another project, you go to another problem, and so on. And things keep going like that. Eventually, I grew fond of it. I started to understand how it works. At the beginning of my master's, I was really, really worried about whether I would like research, about whether I would be good at research. And it is something you learn. It is something I learned to, to like. At the beginning, it was really difficult to do with. But eventually, my expectations got to the right places. So I started understanding that, hey, it's difficult. Hey, I don't need to, to have progress every day and things like that. And eventually, I started to really, really like it. Nowadays, I love doing research. It is. Uh, I spend a great deal of my days working on different problems just because they are stuck in my mind and I'm craving to know whether they work, whether they don't, or what is the answer to these things. And you eventually what frustrates you is not exactly that your methods aren't working, but rather that there are things out there that you want to know, but you can't. <laughs> and you just keep trying, that motivates you to keep trying harder and keep trying better and trying to bring other ideas and so on and so forth. And something that I find really interesting about it that I should also mention in this video is that while I mentioned that you do read what people already know, you often don't read it all. So, for example, when I started learning quantum field theory in Curve Space Time, there, is, there are two things that I expect you should know to learn it, quantum field theory and Curve Space Time. So you actually need to know those things. Sometimes you can bypass one of them. You can uh, depending on how exactly you are approaching it, it might or not be necessary to have a deep previous knowledge of them beforehand. But for example, I already knew basic general relativity, when I, by basic I mean uh, the first part of Walt's book, which are the fundamentals, the book, 
Um, yeah, so introduction to general relativity, manifolds and tensor fields, curvature, Einstein dissipation, cosmology, a little bit about black holes, a little bit about causal structure. They're all, I mean, when we started, I don't think I really knew causal structure, actually. It is a, a great example of something that I learned later on. So I just started reading what I could read, and when I got to some place where I got stuck, and I said, okay, I need to learn about this specific topic, such as causal structure of general relativity, for example, which is necessary for some bits of quantum computing curve spacetime, and by some bits, I do mean a great deal of it. <laughs> then I thought, okay, it's time to give a pause to QFTCS and start working more on my general relativity. So I need to understand these aspects of general relativity better. Then I went to general relativity, learned what I needed, and got back. So I don't really need to crack every prerequisite before you start learning something new. And it's the same thing when I'm doing research. So there were many things while I was working on my problem with the detector and so on that I didn't even expect <laughs> that I would need to know. So for example, eventually I got to the point where I needed to master uh, a few aspects of hypergeometric functions. Now you may ask me, what is a hypergeometric function? And that is exactly what I was asking myself when I needed to use them. <laughs> so eventually I started learning a bit more and I said, okay, I'm going to need to know this. And I asked someone or I asked Mathematica, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I don't remember exactly how it went. But I learned that I would need hypergeometric functions. And then I started learning hypergeometric functions just because I needed that. And I learned exactly what I would need. I didn't go eh, extremely deep into the quite vast theory of hypergeometric functions. So learn what you need, you keep going, you go back when you need, you keep going, you go back when you need, you keep going. And I find this really interesting and really motivating because sometimes when you're at the end of undergraduate, and when I was at the end of undergraduate, I was really nervous about, well, uh, I'm leaving undergraduate, but there are some things that I don't really understand yet. Is this going to be a problem for me later? Is this going to be a reason that I can't do research? And it turns out it isn't. You will need to learn and eventually. For example, at the end of my undergraduate, I was not the best student in statistical mechanics. And yeah, I pretty much knew nothing. I knew a few things, but I couldn't really do calculations, which in physics is pretty much not knowing much. And I got tempted for a while to say not knowing anything, but you still know something. You just can't make predictions, which are, I mean, uh, quite the main point of physics. So, so I was uh, uh, frustrated about it and worried about it, and I talked to my professors about it, and they said, hey, in graduate school, you still get to, to study statistical mechanics and uh, get it clean and get better on your step back, and that's exactly what I did. When I needed, uh, I took a class on statistical mechanics. When I needed some statistical mechanics in my research, I could learn the its and bits that I needed, and so on and so forth. So I don't really need to master every single area of physics before you go into grad school. You can, you master what you can, you do your best. And you start working with that. And when you need to improve on something, you can just go back, learn a little bit more, and keep going. So there are still things from undergraduate that I don't really know with all the details I would like. But when I need them, I just go back, learn a little bit more, close some holes in my undergraduate school, and I keep going. So you don't really need to ace every test. Uh, I think there is a really interesting quotation that I heard once, I don't remember who said it. But it is that in order to be a researcher, you don't need to know everything. You just need to know something that no one else knew before. You just need to figure out something new. You don't need to, to know every single piece of knowledge that was there before. And I find that comforting. I think that releases, at least for me, a lot of the tension I had as an undergraduate in which I had to know everything or anything like that sort. Um, you learn what you can, and you work with what you have, and when you need more, you just go back, learn more stuff, talk to other people, and keep going. And I guess that's it. I think this is a good place to, to end this video. Uh, it is a tough job, so it is tiresome, and sometimes frustrating, because you aren't really having much progress in what you're doing. But it is really fun, really interesting, and I quite love doing what I do. And that's it. I hope that helps you, whatever you're trying to do, whether you're 
thinking about going to physics, whether I already graduate, whether I start grad school. And I guess that's it. Cheers. <laughs>